Well, good evening and welcome. We're uh, expecting a few more people to join us, but in the interest of time, we'll kick this session off. I'm Elizabeth Castelny, CEO of Preservation Virginia, and on behalf of our Board of Trustees and statewide staff, I thank you for joining us this evening. I also want to share my appreciation with our panel of experts uh, for this program. Um, they've done a lot to prepare for, the, for both their presentations in anticipation of a robust question and answer session. So thank you to them. I want to recognize the Department of Historic Resources for helping to organize and fund this series and for our partnership with them throughout the year to ensure that historic places are preserved, utilized, and acknowledged. A big thank you goes to Sonia Ingram, Preservation Virginia's Associate Director of Preservation Field Services. The success of this series is all due to her hard work and leadership in determining the curriculum, organizing the speakers, and promoting the program. So thank you, Sonia, for um, even conceiving of this virtual uh, present, these series of virtual presentations. The Virginia Preservation Academy features live lectures by pre preservation professionals with direct interaction between participants and panelists. Recordings of the webinars will serve as a foundation of a library of training videos, and they will be available both on Virginia Department of Historic Resources and Preservation Virginia's website in the near future. You may also be interested in another tool for Virginia's historic preservation community. That's the Virginia Historic Preservation Network. It's a web-based platform for questions and collaboration. It's a place to share ideas, information, and news about events. Um, so a link to join the preservation network will be in the chat. Um, and we hope you'll join us there. We're grateful to the following sponsors who not only supported this program, but also support our advocacy during the General Assembly session. These sponsors include Rick Barker Properties, Monument Construction, Historic Richmond, Linden Capital, National Trust Insurance Services, Glavan Homes, Piedmont Environmental Council, Herschler, Commonwealth Preservation Group, Jenny Keller, and Trip Pollard. A few bit of housekeeping um, reminders. You may ask questions at any time by typing them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We will hold questions to the end of um, the presentations, but that doesn't mean you can't ask those questions um, right along the way. Preservation Virginia is a certificate maintenance provider for the American Institute of Certified Planners and maintenance credits of 1.5 credits are eligible for this webinar. Instructions for AICP members to capture those cr credits will be posted in the chat. Preservation Virginia recently revised our strate strategic plan with the aim of inspiring and engaging the public to foster, support, and sustain Virginia's historic places. By valuing and prioritizing knowledge and innovation, inclusion and diversity, sustainable stewardship and integrity, we seek to collaborate with individuals and organizations to have, uh, support a more complete understanding of the people and places of history and make connections to our communities today and for the future. The Virginia Preservation Academy is just one example of how Preservation Virginia seeks to expand those networks and support local capacity building to sustain, sustain Virginia's historic places. Tonight's presentation is sure to answer some of those burning questions so many people have when they're kicking off a new project. How do you hire a preservation consultant? And what do you expect after you've signed on the dotted line. Tonight, our panelists will walk you through the steps of what questions to ask, what things you should look for, and how to evaluate proposals once you've, they've been received. And to get us started, I want to welcome Julie Langen, Director of the Department of Historic Resources and our State Historic Preservation Officer. 
If we were meeting in person, I'm sure right now everybody would be standing to their uh, on their feet and giving Julie and the department a standing ovation. She was appointed in 2014 as the director um, after serving as the deputy director and um, at other positions, both at DHR and within the preservation community. She's brought her expertise, talents, and passions for historic places uh, uh, to the great Commonwealth of Virginia. And it's my honor to introduce Julie Langan. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that very wonderful introduction for which I'm very grateful. And I'm also very grateful to Preservation Virginia for conceiving of the Preservation Academy. It was not DHR's idea, it was Preservation Virginia's and Preservation Virginia has done all of the planning for the four modules. And I especially want to thank Sonia for a job really well done. This is the fourth and final in this year's series. And this is the module that I'm most excited about. And that's because it's a topic that on almost a daily basis, I'm questioned about. I think it's the second question to how do I get a grant? Uh, the phone you know, is always ringing. People either wanna know how do I get a, a grant or who should I hire? And they want the department to give them recommendations for consultants. And while we would love to do nothing more than oblige those requests, as state employees, we are forbidden to recommend one consultant over another. And yet finding the right fit between a consultant and a project and a client has everything to do with your likelihood of success. So this decision of who to hire is, is huge. And tonight our speakers will demystify the process and provide guidance on how to choose a consultant and also offer some tips on how to manage your relationship with the consultant. Our moderator for this discussion tonight is Susan Reed, AIA, Director of Historic Preservation at Glavi and Holmes Architecture in Richmond and uh, one of tonight's sponsors. She also serves as chair of the AIA's Historic Resources Committee. She's eminently qualified uh, to moderate tonight and to provide guidance and respond to questions. She's a graduate of the University of Virginia with undergraduate studies in art history and architectural history. She went on from there to get a master's in architecture and a certificate in preservation. And she's worked exclusively in the realm of historic properties for over two decades. Susan specializes in many of the products that people tonight might be seeking out um, to hire consultants to produce, such as uh, condition assessments, feasibility studies, historic structures reports, national register nominations, and the list goes on and on. So Susan will be moderating uh, for us tonight. And uh, I think at this point, I'll just turn it right over to Susan. Thank you so much, Julie. I really appreciate it. And I'm uh, really looking forward to this. This is um, a great topic. Um, and it's very exciting to have um, two wonderful uh, guests tonight to speak to it. Um, Blake McDonald will go first and then uh, Dave McCormick. So I'd like to introduce um, both of them up front. Um, Blake McDonald is a native of Armel County, now residing in Richmond. And he studied architectural history at Connecticut College and the University of Virginia. As the Architectural Survey and Cost Share Program Manager for the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, he travels throughout the Commonwealth supporting the stewardship of Virginia's diverse past. Prior to his current role, Blake worked in cultural resource management, historic preservation advocacy, and museum education. So we'll be hearing from Blake first, and then we'll be followed by Dave McCormick. Dave McCormick is the president of Waukesha Development, a leader in historic tax credit development in many challenging market, markets across Southside Virginia. To date, McCormick has overseen or has underway developments comprising more than 1.2 million square feet. 
reflecting a total investment approaching more than $150 million. His many adaptive reuse projects include the revitalization of a six block neighborhood in Petersburg, Virginia, the repurposing of historic schools in many Virginia towns and counties, including Bedford, Cape Charles and Roanoke, and numerous historic warehouses across the state. The Waukesha team has also delivered successful restaurants and breweries, including Demolition Coffee, Buttermilk Bake Shop, Trapezium Brewing Company, and Beals Beer, the latter two of which are each 30 barrel production breweries distributing across the state of Virginia. In Amherst, Waukesha has developed both the former Old, Sel Old Seminole Elementary School into a 41 unit market rate apartment community known as the Westie and the restaurant and brewery known as Camp Trapezium at the former Amherst Mill. Waukesha was also the owner of Winton, which it purchased in 2018 and returned to profitability. So with those introductions, we'll first hear from Blake. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susan. Really pleased to be here tonight. I'm gonna to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can you hear my voice and see my screen? Can I get a wave or a thumbs up? Awesome, all right. Well, thanks so much. I'm really happy to be here tonight and share some thoughts about hiring historic preservation consultants. Over the next 15 minutes, I'm gonna to talk to you about what preservation consultants do, um, why you might need to engage one. I'll also describe how to successfully hire and work with a preservation consultant. Uh, before we begin, I want to quickly frame out why we selected this topic and how it applies to our audience, all of you tonight. I'm gonna to get into more detail about the type of work preservation consultants do, but essentially they're the folks who you can hire to complete historic resource documentation and planning projects. If you're an individual property owner, you might hire a preservation consultant to complete a National Register nomination or historic structures report. If you're a local government representative, your community could engage preservation consultants to perform a large historic resource survey or develop a preservation plan. And if you're a real estate developer, preservation consultants can assist you in determining National Register eligibility for a property that you've bought and potentially help you to write historic rehabilitation tax credit application. So that's just a thumbnail sketch of how preservation consultants might overlap with the work that I know many of you on the webinar tonight are already doing. Zooming out for just a moment, I'm here tonight representing the Virginia Department of Historic Resources. We are the State Historic Preservation Office and you can see our mission listed at the bottom of the screen. I hope many of you are already familiar with some of our programs, including the National Register of Historic Places in Virginia, the Virginia Landmarks Register, our Historical Highway Marker Program, and of course, our state and federal historic rehabilitation tax credit program. DHR routinely hires preservation consultants to support several of our grant programs. We also assist outside clients, as Julie mentioned, in developing projects and seeking out qualified consultants to work on them to the extent we're able. Uh, so that's the knowledge base that DHR is bringing to the table here. Now the term preservation consultant, it refers to a pretty large span of cultural resource management professionals, ranging from architectural historians to engineers. Preservation consultants may be called upon to do any of the tasks that you see listed on the right-hand side of the screen and more. Some consultants specialize in specific types of work. Some consultants are nested within larger firms that can do all sorts of different things. As you can see on, on this list, the work completed by preservation consultants, it's focused on documentation and preservation planning tools. Oftentimes these products, they're intended as guides for long range projects or to explain why a place is historically significant. As a result, because of that, preservation consultants may not always be the first person you need to call. 
let's use an example. Let's say you live in a historic house and you've got a front porch column that's rotten and needs to be fixed. For an isolated repair project like that, you'd probably wanna to turn to tradespeople or contractors who specialize in historic buildings rather than a preservation consultant as your first stop. On the flip side, if you had just purchased a large old house that needs lots of work and you want to use rehabilitation tax credits to perform that work, a preservation consultant could help you with that longer process of documentation and arranging phases of tax credit work. I hope that that distinction makes sense to you all and I'm happy to answer questions about it afterwards. In the list of tasks that you see on the right hand side of the screen, I've placed an asterisk next to the project types that DHR staff like myself are usually more involved with through our grant programs. Over the next few minutes, I'm gonna be focusing on consultants with specialty in those areas. Dave's gonna to speak to you right after me a little bit about the tax credit consultant side of things. So I've hinted at why folks engage preservation consultants, but let's talk a bit more about that. First and foremost, not every preservation effort requires a consultant. Smaller preservation documentation projects, those can be completed by individuals or groups without outside professional assistance. Those of you who've worked with DHR in the past, you know that we encourage submission of preliminary information forms or PIFs to assess National Register eligibility before someone starts down the path of a nomination. Those PIFs can often be completed by property owners, maybe with a little bit of help from DHR staff. It's not mandatory for you to hire a consultant to complete that document for you. The same goes for National Register nominations. Property owners, they're not barred by DHR, by the federal government from writing and submitting National Register nominations independently. It's a lot of work, but it can be done. So why would you hire a preservation consultant if it's not required? The short answer is that it makes your life a lot easier. Taking the example of the National Register nomination, a preservation consultant, you know, they have ample experience writing that type of document. They're familiar with the requirements for them. They know where to find the right sources, which archives to go to, who to talk to. And as a result of this expertise, they can often complete that nomination quickly and ensure that the necessary material is there so that we at DHR reviewing it or our colleagues at the National Park Service reviewing it, they don't have to ask for a bunch of revisions or additional information. Very briefly, I wanna to talk to you about how the hiring of a preservation consultant fits into the larger framework of a project. At the beginning of any project, be it preservation related or otherwise, you of course wanna do your, your background research. You wanna figure out what's your objective? What are you trying to achieve? Once you've done that, you can develop your project scope, your outline, your blueprint, what needs to be done, under what schedule, and what are the requirements that apply to your project. If you're hiring a preservation consultant, this is the point that you would share that scope with consultants and request their, their bid, request their price to do that work. There are many ways to do this, ranging from a, a formal request for proposals to more of an informal distribution if you have specific individuals or uh, firms already in mind to do the work. Likewise, you can request a very simple quote in return or a, a more detailed um, proposal with lots of information about the consultant. Once you have that bid in hand, whatever form it takes, you wanna review it to make sure that you understand it. Uh, you understand what the consultant is promising to do and that it matches with your expectations for the project. You may wish to consider multiple bids um, rather than going straight to one consultant, depending on your project and the type of work you're doing. And once you've selected your consultant and officially hired them, finished the contracting paperwork, you're going to want to conduct a kickoff meeting, address any details about the startup of the project, and from there, continue monitoring your consultant's progress until you can together celebrate the successful finished product. Of course, I make that sound probably a lot easier than it may be, especially if it's your first time doing that. Uh, one aspect that 
most folks find really challenging about um, the process is determining you know, which preservation consultant to contact once you have that scope ready to go. Who's your first call? In order to develop a better sense of who might be able to do your work, you may want to first ask around to colleagues in the preservation field. That could be anyone from historic property owners um, that you've worked with before, that you know, your neighbors, uh, local governments around you to see if they have experience hiring preservation consultants. I would also recommend finding similar completed projects to see not only what should that completed product look like, but who did the work. DHR's webpage is a great place to start. We've got lots of examples of completed survey reports and preservation plans. Of course, all of our National Register nominations are posted online as well. Each of these documents will, will list the consultant who completed them. So as an example, let's say you had a modernist office building that you wanted to list on the National Register, like the one on the screen here. You may want to look at the DHR register webpage to learn about similar listed properties and who wrote those nominations. And, and while you're welcome to, to review and um, glean information from any of these documents on DHR's webpage, as Julie has already mentioned, you know, by state law, DHR staff, we're not able to provide specific or qualitative recommendations on preservation consultants. That just wouldn't be fair. We do, however, keep a running list of folks who are working in the preservation field in Virginia. We call this our trades directory. And the trades directory includes columns, you can see on the right-hand side, for products like National Register nominations, survey, other planning documents. You can easily you know, weed out which consultants provide which services. This trades directory, it's maintained by DHR, but anyone who asks to be on it is added and we do update it pretty regularly. Uh, listing on the trades directory, it's not a, a, an endorsement by the agency. Rather, we use it as a clearinghouse to connect people with service providers who may be able to assist them. And I mentioned earlier how in some instances you may need kind of more of a contractor than a consultant for something like a small repair project on your historic resource. The trades directory does include listings for the types of tradespeople who could help you with that type of work. Okay, so now I've shown you, I hope, the kind of what and the why of preservation consultants. And I wanna spend the last few minutes addressing some common pitfalls, um, mistakes that I've made and that I've seen others make as well. We probably all heard of AAA, the American Automobile Association providing support and insurance and different incentives for driver members. I'm gonna use the same acronym and then share with you my tips for hiring preservation consultants. Our AAA is going to stand for Ask, Assess, and Assist. At the very beginning of the process, um, as you're planning your preservation project, performing your background research, you need to ask yourself these questions. These are the, the things, basically, that a preservation consultant is going to need to know from you in order to provide an accurate bid and then perform the project to your specifications. You need to be as clear as possible um, with your project scope and your expectations for the work to follow. But you don't have to go it alone. Um, DHR and Preservation Virginia staff, we can help you develop your project. We're happy to do so. Ensure that you have the right requirements outlined. We can even assist you in producing a workable project budget. Please contact us if you have questions about what your project scope should entail. Once you have a good scope in hand, you've shared that scope with a number of potential preservation consultants. Once those consultants have returned their bids to you, it's time to consider which consultant is right for your project. At this stage, you need to carefully assess the materials that you've received from those consultants um, who are interested in performing your project. Most importantly, um, you need to figure out, you know, does the, the proposal or the bid that they've put forward, their quote, does it address the work in question? Is it clear, concise, and error-free? Whether you are accepting full proposals or simple quotes, it's always a good idea to make references, reference requests, part of that process. 
um, then you need to follow up on those references. Ideally, the references provided to you should match the type of work you're hiring a consultant to complete. So if you're hiring someone to do a national register nomination, ideally they can provide you with references for past projects where they've successfully written a national register nomination. Overall, this assessment period, it's used to make sure that all of your questions are answered and that the consultant is fully aware of what you need them to do. This is one of those situations where a little bit of additional due diligence on the front end will likely yield a better result. Once you have your preservation consultant under contract to perform your work, your job is not done. This is one of the most you know, common mistakes that we see folks make. They've hired their experts, they've hired their consultants, so they just sit back and wait for the finished product. Instead of doing that, you can assist your preservation consultant by connecting them to the people and materials that they need to make their process more efficient, more fruitful. Um, make your knowledge available to them. Ask to review drafts so that you can provide feedback as they're going along. I find that one of the best ways to ensure collaboration and, and be of assistance to your preservation consultant um, is to schedule regular check-in meetings. You know, these can be really brief, they can be informal, but they give both parties the chance to ask questions, provide updates, talk about next steps, address obstacles, all those good things. The last thing that I'm gonna to touch on this evening is the funding aspect. Um, hiring a preservation consultant requires money. Um, as Julie mentioned, we get lots of calls about you know, not only how do you find these people, but how do you pay for them? I'll once again encourage you to reach out to me if you need help figuring out sort of the budgeting behind hiring a consultant for different types of work. But in terms of securing funds for for consultants to perform things like a national register nomination, you know, you really want to cast a wide net. Um, DHR, we do have a couple of grants that help to pay for consultants to perform survey and write nominations, but those grants all require local government applicants. They tend to be focused on broad-based community-wide projects rather than individual nominations for private properties, for example. Keep in mind that anytime there is a disaster in our state, um, there's a chance that DHR and other preservation organizations may receive money to support historic resources in the disaster affected areas. If you're in charge of historic resource that sustains damage from a disaster, make sure that that damage is really well documented, lots of photos, and then reach out to DHR about the possibility of any available relief funding. And finally, one of the best ways to keep an eye on grant opportunities is just to follow social media accounts, as simple as it sounds, for organizations that are generally in charge of distributing those funds. Um, Department of Historic Resources, I know that our Facebook pages and our Twitter and whatnot, we will, of course, post all of our grants, but also post other grant opportunities that we come across for folks working on historic resources. National Park Service will consistently update with the grants that they're running. So just be aware of all of those different feeds and the information that may come across there. And you may be wondering why I've got an image of the Virginia Museum of History and Culture up on the screen. And that's to remind anyone on this webinar who isn't already aware of an exciting new, very new annual grant fund supporting a wide range of preservation activities called the Commonwealth History Fund managed by the Virginia Museum of History and Culture. I believe they'll be taking their um, applications for their second round of funding towards the end of this year. So there are new opportunities that arrive from time to time, like the Commonwealth History Fund, yet another reason to keep an eye towards social media and other preservation news sources for updates on those. I am now going to pass it on to Susan Reed to briefly run through what a consultant's proposal may look like. Uh, my, my information is um, listed here and I would once more encourage you to please reach out to me or DHR's regional staff if you need assistance or have further questions developing a preservation project or about uh, preservation consultants and the role they play. And I look forward to hearing what folks have to say 
uh, during our Q&A. So Susan, it's all you, thanks. Great, thank you, Blake. Let me share my proposal that I'm gonna walk us through. All right, that should be up on the screen. So to tie into the assess uh, component of what Blake was talking about, um, as a preservation consultant, we respond to proposals all the time. So I'm going to quickly just walk through a proposal so you can see an example of one um, uh, and how it addresses this, the actual request that was put in by the client. This is an RFQ, a request for qualifications. You can also have an RFP, a request for proposals. The main difference is that in this case, um, there was a grant associated with this project. So the dollar amount was already set. They knew what they had. They just needed the qualifications of the right consultant team to um, do the historic structure report. If it were a proposal, we would actually be providing pricing. Uh, something else to note is that um, this is a competitive situation. It's kind of good to maybe um, seek three to five consultant teams, um, having, you know, not just one, but having several to compare would be um, important. In this case, it was step one was to send in the RFQ. Then the next step was um, an actual interview. So uh, we interviewed and then the, um, the owner was able to select their final consultant team from that process. So um, I will just let me make sure I can flip through here. Um, let's see. So we start off with um, basically just a letter. Um, the uh, request for qualifications is very clear about the content that they want to see. So we are feeding back to them a complete understanding that we read what they wanted, we understood it, and we are repeating to them that we have heard them and uh, are making sure that if they've asked for certain criteria, we acknowledge that we can meet those criteria. So um, for example, um, in the understanding of the project, um, they provided a, a specifics of what they wanted, including qualification um, uh, standards for the team, um, whether it needed to meet the Secretary, Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation or restoration, um, uh, arranging for um, a site visit. Um, we also did that in advance. So there were very specific things that they included um, and the scope of services. Um, and also confirming the end product, um, they required a historic structure report, but also specifically um, needed to see that we had done similar work with similar buildings um, recently. So for example, here's the outline of uh, our understanding of what they need. Historic structure report includes the components, um, the opinion of the cost. We, they asked for what we thought of the budget. The budget was already set. So we confirmed that within that budget, this is what we can offer. Also confirmed that we had the capacity and the experience. They did want um, the staff to meet the Secretary, Interior, um, uh, Secretary of the Interior's um, qualifications for the staff as well. Um, and then we provided some qualifications and clarifications ourselves to confirm that for the budget and for the historic structure report, we were not doing laser scanning or hazardous material studies, et cetera. So again, in their proposal uh, or request for proposals, um, we made sure that we understood what they were asking and we're confirming that we're not suggesting that um, we will do other services outside of that. So that has to be very clear. So after that, we also included references and um, anyone hiring a consultant should check their references. Um, we also have a letter of recommendation here just for their benefit. And then the projects I mentioned, for example, um, uh, the consultant should, you can put a requirement that they have experience with similar projects within the past five years, for example, that they've done at least five projects that are similar within the past five years. Um, so that's important to show samples of work that shows that you can cover um, the type of, of project. So we have included project sheets um, to show that we do historic work. Um, we included um, several of them of a variety of, of types um, and 
historic structures report experience as well. So this is something that you should see in your proposals that is applicable. And also the project team, um, make sure that you see their experience, their resumes um, and other projects that they've worked on. So we also with this project had um, a historic Mason on staff. So here is his information as well as um, a historic structural engineer. So we included the information for those consultants as well. So you wanna make sure that you see the team that you need for your project. Um, and that's, that's it. We also had National Register property experience. So that was uh, the extent of our um, proposal and we were short to make sure that it um, addressed all of their concerns and their request for qualifications so that they knew exactly who they were getting and they can compare apple to apples with their, uh, with their team. So that's all I had, just so you could see what a proposal looks like. And I'm gonna hand it over to Dave. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, Dave. Okay, so well, I wanted to give you some real world experience of, of um, I'm attacking some of these bigger problems. And you know, some of this stuff seems like, I think at times to the outside world, like it's, you know, we kind of go in there, fix stuff up and it's all great and we move on to the next project. But really there's so many complexities to doing these kinds of things. And, and uh, the consultants can really be very helpful. And I put this picture up it's, it seems like kind of over the top, but this is sometimes in some of these places we're working, this is what we're actually dealing with. And this is a very specific uh, structure here that we had to deal with uh, two years ago out in Amherst County. So um, I wanted to use it as our kind of poster child project and, and our entry into talking about this kind of thing. This is an old exterior barn on the Amherst milling site in Amherst, in the town of Amherst, Virginia. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so um, I just wanted to kind of run down. The, uh, this particular uh, project had, I think, five structures on it, maybe six. It had an old mill, had uh, a lot of out agricultural outbuildings, an old miller's house, and then a 1920s era four square that we turned into an Airbnb. So we were trying to make a brewery out there, a farm operation and an Airbnb. So it had lots of different uh, things to think about. There were structural issues everywhere, environmental problems. We had, I was, I was laughing, but it's a big deal. We had all these animal and insect infestations. Um, so, and we had lots of governmental oversight, not just the National Park Service and the DHR, but VDOT, the county, the town, we had the DEQ involved, VMRC, ABC, because we had alcohol licenses and TTV. So lots of folks interested in what we're doing out there and lots of complexity. And we were trying to ultimately make a uh, viable business out of, out of all this. So we're not just the developer, we're actually the end user operator in this particular project. Next slide. So I want to just give you a visual about what we were looking at here. Um, this reminds me of that picture that um, Susan showed earlier of that, that uh, interior of that house. But um, sometimes when you run into some of this stuff, it's there's really deeply flawed structural issues. These buildings were built in a very utilitarian ways back in the day, and we're trying to bring them up to not just a, a code compliant state but you know, something that's gonna last, something that's gonna be a little more structurally sound, but also something that complies with the standards. So this is just a, a very tip of the iceberg sense of what we got ourselves into on this mill project. There, were no, there was no plumbing in this property. Uh, the whole thing was destroyed by termites. Um, it was floating over a mill race, an old water wheel. Lots of deflection. At one point in the building, there was a deflection of about 18 inches of, of uh, it was like a roller coaster inside this place. So we had to really dismantle a lot of it to get it back together. And some of the questions we had were, 
well, you know, what, what kind of timber do we have to use? How do we really uh, get this back into a usable state? How do we insulate a building like this? And our consultants uh, on this particular project were very helpful uh, answering a lot of those questions. And it was really a, a very on the fly type thing as we discovered, as we took this thing apart, what we were dealing with, how to stop the flooding issues, how to, how to get it plumbed correctly and, and uh, all these different things. So this was a really crazy one. And um, this year, just to tip the iceberg. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this was the little Miller house and we were trying to make this uh, habitable. So we, we needed people to, to live here at the end. And it was never on any, uh, any grid or infrastructure of any kind. It was also, the whole thing was basically a, a beehive. If you look in those walls, we had to get a, a couple folks out there to just remove all the bees. We had snakes all up in this thing. And the foundation was just completely degraded. So um, we, here, one of the uh, questions we had, as you all tell you, as we go through these slides, we had to really think about what was the primary structure in terms of the what was one of the oldest things on this property. And that helped us identify what the primary structure was, what led to questions about what we could do with the secondary structures. And everyone thinks of the mill, that property is the mill being the main structure. But in fact, this Miller house was the oldest uh, building on the property. And we quote, led with this. And that allowed us to have some flexibility as we treated the other uh, buildings and had some more flexibility about what we did there. I would never have really known that or been able to strategize like that without the help of a really seasoned historic tax credit consultant leading the way there. Next slide. So this is, here's that barn that we I led with. And I, I think this is really um, a, a funny slide. And you know, when, uh, when I walked up to this thing, uh, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't call myself a lay person. I kind of get how this all works, but you know, in my mind, this felt like a teardown. Their structure was a nightmare. The slab inside was cracked everywhere. That picture on the left is the foundation and the, that middle right picture, that's what was holding this thing up. It's clearly about to fall down. Um, you know, on one hand, I always try to save everything, but on the other hand, this was uh, threatening uh, to fall down and collapse. The roof was blowing off and every time the wind blew, it looked like someone get decapitated by that metal roof out there. But uh, in fact, the consultant here was very, very helpful in negotiating with the DHR and we had a hell of a time figuring out whether or not we could take this down or save it or what we could do with it because it, it turned out the answer wasn't so obvious. And in this particular case, uh, the DHR uh, demanded that we save this structure. So we actually, it's still standing like this. Uh, and in order to get our tax credits, we had to leave this thing right there. So our consultant in that case was, was really protecting our interests rather than just letting us run in there and, and take this thing apart. And uh, they actually uh, advised us to keep it. So that, that held our, our application intact. Uh, next slide. Um, we were dealing with all sorts of crazy issues. This, one of the buildings on this property used to be an ice house um, that was run by a big old diesel uh, engine, a compressor. So there's a very tank outside. There were multiple levels of flooring inside a six foot pit inside the building that uh, was where they actually froze the ice blocks in old metal tins. Um, that was covered over by plywood and about six inches over the floor on the inside. You had all these old pedestals, catchment basins, etc. The whole thing was crazy. And the question is, how, how do you make this into a viable space? You know, so. Uh, and you had all this old machinery and we really, you know, we have an interest in showing that stuff off and really, uh, uh, you know, treating it almost like a museum, showing off all this old stuff, but also we need to monetize it. And so we had to figure out how to navigate all of this stuff. And um, the consultant here, very helpful in trying to figure out what to even do, what was acceptable, what was allowable, what was sacred and what to kind of use as a, a, a window into this thing to figure out what the baselines were. 
Okay, next slide. Um, we also, in a lot of our projects, we run into one-off oddball situations. Um, you know, how, how you restore or fix a water wheel here, what's acceptable. In this particular case, we want this, we wanted this water wheel to run again, but it was out of plumb. The axles were uh, frozen, the bushings were destroyed, and the foundations for the axles were completely uh, corroded. So um, we had help identifying, in, in fact, that water wheel is something you could have bought out of a catalog back in the day. I didn't know that. And uh, we learned a lot about that, learned about uh, how to, you know, we had to go, you know, figure out who restored bushings like that. Turns out, amazingly, there's always somebody who knows something about everything. And uh, we're able to get this uh, restored and accomplished. Uh, but here again, uh, you know, really the, the help of the consultants kind of figuring out what was an acceptable treatment of this thing and how to, how to get it. Uh, not just working again, but what was the right way to get it back um, and be within the standards on something like this. Next slide. We also have this building that, you know, back in the, I think there's a mill been on the site since the 1700s. And back in the day, there, you know, there wasn't a lot of pavement, there were no strip malls up the road. And uh, all you know, you, you didn't have these flooding concerns because you had um, pervious surfaces everywhere. Now, well, now I, I uh, it's interesting talking to the guy I bought this from who's, who's in his 80s. You know, he saw the development, even in this little town happen and the water issues getting worse and worse over the years. And this mill is constantly threatened by water. So the question is, how could we, how could we, what could we do to the foundation that would not allow the building to get ruined every time the water came up, uh, you know, and, and just protect our interests and our investment there. So treating a building like this for stuff like that really requires some um, focus and specialty on uh, the behalf of consultants, not just historic, but also engineers, uh, insur the insurance company. I mean, all sorts of folks who can help make decisions about how to how to address something like this, which is very alarming. Next slide. Uh, and again, very unique situation in this particular mill. We had, uh, you know, we, we developed lots of old schools or warehouses, um, where, you know, old, old buildings, but this particular thing was really unique. It had all these old, really cool uh, shoots for all the flour and rye and everything that used to go up and down through these tubes. We want to save all that stuff. Um, all this old um, equipment, all built into this thing. And the, the building is just an amazing uh, feat of engineering construction, really done without plans or anything, you know, over the years, all the way through the 50s. And uh, we really want to save all that stuff. But we needed to take some of it out just to have a space that you could move around in. So the question was, you know, what what was it? What was okay to move? Uh, was it okay to move some of it and relocate it somewhere else in the building? You know, it was hard to figure out what was okay to do in here. And here again, this gets to the bigger picture. Was you know, we all thought of the mill as the primary structure, and because it was not, and the Miller House was, we had a little more flexibility to get creative here and think through how to relocate things and what to, what to really save and focus on. In this particular building, the milling equipment was on all of the floors. There's four floors in the mill and the top three floors, we did nothing. They did, we just broom swept them. And so it's a virtual museum of milling history upstairs. And the downstairs, we just lightly cleared things out to make it viable as a, a brewery and a tap room. Next slide. Uh, over the years, you know, a lot of these buildings get modified and you would never really know that unless you really dug into the history and had real, uh, you know, in, even interviews with people who once had involvement in the buildings and driving up to this thing, the way the state that it was in in, 19, in uh, 2000, I guess it was 2018 when we first encountered it. You'd think that mill 
was there the whole time and it's just this one big historic structure well in fact in the 40s it burned and we found that out from the, the ex-owner that's actually one of those people in that picture is he is him as a boy in 1941 i believe and that mill was only a two-story mill at the time and it ha had significant fire damage and was rebuilt in 42 or 43 to to what you see on the right so that was really important about thinking about how to uh, address this project and the the digging into that history and the research is something that our consultants are really great at they know where to find good information and that informs the application that they make on our behalf next topic next next slide um, so here again, I was, you know, wanted to kind of uh, talk about some of the finer points of this. As we did demo on this building, we could really dig in and see where the old structure met the quote new in the 40s. You could see a little mortise and tenon, the reuse of beams, which is really interesting and helped uh, that kind of on the fly information and how we, we would make amend an application and what we might do differently as we went along consults are really helpful with that. Next slide. Um, strategic questions, you know, we're trying to always, always to monetize these properties, you know, it's really, um, I think it's an important thing to, and a responsible thing to do to not just take an old building and fix it up, but the, the real way to preserve it is actually to create cash flow to allow for its operational future. And so we need to be th thoughtful, of, of course, about the standards. We also got to be sometimes playing it right up against the line to make sure that we have a viable going concern once we're done. So we want to be really thoughtful about what we can and can't modify or what we need to be, or how we need to work around that stuff. Um, when I say what must we save, you know, it's not that we don't want to save things. We do always. And sometimes we wind up with, like we do at the mill, a giant shed full of stuff that we don't have to do with at the end of it, but we're saving everything. But really uh, being thoughtful about rectifying some of those construction errors, or I don't know if we call them errors, but they were just had a different utilitarian past that now we're trying to make right and build things that last. Um, or when I talk about VDOT, some of those other uh, government uh, overseers, they don't care what any of us think about any of this stuff and will come in and absolutely destroy budgets and change things in ways that we just, that, you know, don't really jive with anything we're doing on the historic side. So we got to be really thoughtful about that and coordinating. And a lot of times our, it's not here just historic, but we might have our civil engineers syncing up with historic and all these consultants, uh, even environmental working together to solve the bigger problems. Um, environmental being that next bullet point, sometimes, you know, that can be a, a, a huge issue with buried tanks, things that aren't known or listed on the uh, underground storage tank databases, uh, asbestos, you know, uh, that can be a huge issue and lead. So always dealing with that with our environmental consultants syncing up with our historic folks. And then of course, zoning, parking, et cetera, that kind of plays into BDOT, but also code compliance uh, with the county. And sometimes those things don't sync up. Paving a parking lot is not always okay. I and mean, you can't assume that it is. So we have to be really thoughtful about even our site conditions on historic projects and the consultants can be very helpful with that. Next slide. Um, so, you know, as you hear a good consultant understands the nuances and the opportunities. I say the opportunities because sometimes we get really down about all this. It can seem like the burden of compliance. It can just be a very heavy one. And sometimes you just want to throw your hands up in the air and say, I don't, this just makes no sense. It's illogical or it's not going to work. And a lot of times the consultants find opportunities and ways to get things done that you just wouldn't realize uh, are there. And that's, that is a huge value that they bring. Um, being a buffer between the reviewers and the, the municipality or the agencies is really important. Um, they can have uh, really knowledgeable, educated conversations with folks and speak their language that we, even as developers, sometimes don't speak. Um, 
and then uh, advocating for us based on that specialized uh, experience. And ultimately, you know, like all these consultants are staving off disaster. We, that you hire these folks, not just to add value, but to keep us all out of trouble. And the last thing we want to do is spend a couple million bucks on something only to find out we're not in compliance. And my God, things drag on forever or we, it's never happened to us, but you know, uh, being out of compliance in such a way that you might lose your ability to syndicate historic tax credits. So a good consultant just keeps you way out of that area and way out of trouble in that regard. Uh, and I wanted to mention all these consultants charge fees that are tax credit eligible as well. So it's that's a, a really great value. Next topic, next next slide. Um, I just want to hear mention. I know I don't know if it's okay that I'm talking about who our consultants are, but this is who we use. Um, Commonwealth Preservation Group is the main one here uh, out in Norfolk. The, the they're the only group we've ever worked with and really helpful. And then this is our our uh, the rest of the folks on our team. Um, Commonwealth Environmental, Cornerstone Architects. Uh, we use uh, other architects uh, uh, at times and our uh, Jeff Robinson does our structural civil BDOT coordination, all that stuff. And then we have, we do have specialty legal and, uh, and our CPAs that really specialize in all of the things related to historic tax credits can be extremely complex uh, syndicating uh, deals. And they too keep us out of trouble advise us on doing the right thing, and sometimes figure out who to partner with. Next slide. And that's it, this is the mill almost done. We did a lot more to it than what you see here, but this is uh, this got us, uh, um, we're, we're about 90% here in this picture and finally did open that project in June of 2021. So thank you very much. I answer any questions if you like. Thank you so much, Dave. Um, I think maybe for um, Sonia, are we going to have uh, everybody back up for the questions? Hi. Yep. And we have a couple that have come in. So please do type your questions uh, into the Q and A. And I will start with one of our questions. Um, so this, I think, is a Blake question regarding the uh, consultants list. Um, does DHR remove names from the from the contractor list? Uh, for example, um, if there's bad feedback. Yeah, thanks so much for that question. As much as we would like to be able to kind of match you with the preservation consultant that is best for your project, state procurement law, it prohibits us from making a recommendation that specific. And that extends to communicating verbally or via the trades directory who you should not hire or um, who we have not received good feedback on. So for that trades directory, you know, we add any consultant or any group or any tradesperson who asks to be added um, and we do not vet them. They do not have to meet any minimum requirement. We also don't remove anyone from that list unless they ask to be removed. So, you know, I'd really encourage you to use the list, to have it in your back pocket, but you do still have to follow through with the due diligence of assessing who am I going to request a bid from, getting their references, making sure that you've got the information you need. It's a springboard, but it's not going to get you all the way there. Um, so thanks for that question. So I could clarify that. That's great. Blake, if I may just add, um, the one thing that we can do is direct you to projects similar to yours. So, you know, feel free to reach out to us, describe to us your project, and we can maybe suggest a project similar that would, you know, benefit you from doing some research into. The other thing we can do is help you determine whether or not someone meets the Secretary of the Interior's professional qualification standards. So those are two things we can do. And remember that folks at your local historical society or um, at, at any number of other organizations that, that work in the historic preservation um, 
field, they may not be bound by the same regulations that we are. So as Julie said, we can definitely get you some products that will help you, but ask around um, and, and you may get different insights from, from other groups as well. Thanks. Excellent, thank you. Um, that actually um, I, leads to sort of a question for Dave um, about um, how you find consultants that maybe wouldn't be on that list, like um, a water wheel repair consultant and other um, unusual for, sort of quirkier uh, needs. Um, how do you go about finding someone? Um, and maybe uh, word of mouth, um, is that a significant component? Yeah, well, word of mouth is huge for the, I say the foundational pool of consultants that we have. You know, that's how we wound, wind up talking to a guy like Jeff Robinson or, or um, you know, and, so, and I'll admit, you know, we're working in smaller communities. So sometimes it's hard to, to go out and get a bigger engineering firm like a Draper Aiden. I mean, we like what they do, but, uh, but we really need to be thoughtful about our budgets and things like that. And, um, you know, we're more mom and pop shop kind of folks when it comes to the engineers and whatnot. But that being said, when you're trying to research a water wheel or a piece of equipment, um, sometimes we literally just go, go to the internet and find, and it turns out the guy that helped us on that one was in Vermont and was a specialist in, you know, the, these metal uh, water wheels from that era. It was fascinating. And uh, there's an incredible amount of information out there that both he provided and then I could find. And, you know, we could even get down to the horsepower that that water wheel would generate at certain revolutions per minute based on the head uh, coming, you know, the water coming through the race and all this stuff. It was really incredible and helped us do some calculations about power generation conversion off of the mechanical energy that that thing might produce. I mean, on and on. We also could look at um, the history of some of that milling equipment. Um, that is incredibly rare stuff. But there, interestingly, there is in, in Amherst, there used to be, uh, it was a big milling community and there's another mill right down the road. And those folks knew a lot about it too. They're actually milling grain down the road. And uh, you know, you start establishing this network of people and we keep them in our phones and find ourselves, you know, routinely returning to them or asking them for recommendations and the network just grows and grows. Excellent, thank you. Another question, um, I think this is the um, question about historic cemeteries. What if you have or know of a historic cemetery that has been neglected or abandoned? Do you need a consultant to assist and what would they do? Uh, Susan, I'll take that question. Um, just this past year, DHR was able to hire for the first time a full-time cemetery preservation expert. And I would suggest you reach out to her. Her name is Joanna Wilson Green, and she and others within the department are happy to work with you. They can come out and make a site visit. They can talk to you about how you delineate boundaries. They can advise you on what financial assistance is available for maintenance. So I think reaching out to the department in that instance is the first step. Excellent. And um, her contact information has been put in the chat for anybody that needs that. Another question, uh, how much follow-up do you do to evaluate work quality, craftsmanship and materials? Is that well, maybe I, a deep question? <laughs> yeah, on our end, I mean, that's a, uh, actually, um, happens at many levels. You know, I'm, I am, we hire the general contractor, obviously to be an overseer of subs. We use a lot, a lot of folks we use are tried and true. We have them on all the projects. So we kind of know their quality of work, but there's plenty of times where we don't know the subs coming in and we have to be extremely attentive to all of that stuff all the way through the project. Um, and so I'm personally doing that. Um, while at the same time the GC is doing that, while at the same time the architect is doing that, very, very important. And then also the bank is doing that. So they're not maybe as attentive as they go and do their draw inspection. Every time we look for a draw, they've got to go make sure work got done. But our architect is really um, one of those 
sort of legs of the stool, really going out there and making sure things are done to spec, the quality's there, the detail's there. The detail on these historic projects is incredible, incredibly important. And it's very important to me. So we're, we're all working on that at all at one time at, at all times. I'll add to that, that if it's a tax credit project or a grant project, the department staff may very well make a site visit, uh, particularly a grant project. Uh, we'll, we'll go on site once or twice and, and make sure the work has been done. In the case of a tax credit project, we require extensive documentation at the part three level, including completed photographs. Um, so we're, we're definitely following up to make sure the work is complete. Thank you. Another question um, about, um, how do I know if I need to have a consultant for lead paint and asbestos if I'm a private property owner? Uh, well, I, I can answer that. So. Uh, one thing that we do, th there's, I guess, two ways to look at this. One, one is before we even acquire a property, that's part of our due diligence. And we hire, there was a person on that list that I had there that we hire to go in and do a full blown assessment of that property. So you have, you have three different things happening. You have what's called a phase one environment, environmental report. And that's really looking at very tanks. Um, it could be, the discovery of uh, any kind of chemicals on the ground, looking for uh, unidentified drums of chemicals just sitting around. I mean, God knows what we find on these properties. But then, and then doing some research and seeing what the thing, what the building used to be used for. You know, could see nothing, and then find out it was a dry cleaner, and you could un have a God knows uh, uh, problems in the ground. And then uh, you also have this lead and asbestos assessments and a, and a uh, consultant will go around and take samples from all sorts of places around the building, send them to a lab and figure out if you have things like friable versus non-friable asbestos, what percent of the, of the material is asbestos. You can have asbestos in your, drop, in your uh, plaster, which is like or your old sheetrock, and we can be everywhere, mastics, um, roofing material. I mean, it can really be pervasive and it seemed to be everywhere back in the day. And so you just want to have, it's not the end of the world, but you know, a, you know, a strategy in a sense of what it's going to cost to get it out. That's tax credit eligible uh, work, but you also have to really be thoughtful and strategic about how that work's going to get done and what it's going to cost. And those people are going to help assess that. Now, if you already own the property, a slightly different story, you could be really in a, a, a little bit of a jam there. We always use those reports for negotiating before we get into a deal. But if you're already on the property, it's really much simpler. You're still very important to have those studies and think about the abatement of those things and, and how you're going to get that done. But um, there again, there's just getting those studies. So they're not that expensive. A phase one report is probably 1600 bucks. Uh, lead and asbestos might be this, around the same, you know, depending on how big the building is or whatever. But for that three grand, four grand, whatever it is, uh, can really save your butt, you know, or, or help guide you along the way if you have that in the building. And we, we've gotten familiar enough with us, with what that all looks like that we kind of know going in what we're looking at. We still get it done. The lenders require it. Uh, a lot of tax credit uh, syndication groups require that stuff. So we just do it out of hand, but, but uh, that's really the way that we get that done. I'll add to that. Um, if you are a historic property owner, um, even if your property is national register listed, you do not necessarily have to consult with DHR if you need to do that type of remediation work. Um, so you would not be required by us to have a, a historic preservation consultant go between. Um, but that is yet another time where you could reach out to DHR staff to say, hey, I've got this issue. Do you have any do you have any leads? Do you have any thoughts or best practices? So that's not a scenario where there would be a a requirement for you to engage a, a consultant unless you wanted, as Dave mentioned, unless you wanted to use tax credits to to do that work. Thank you, Blake. Um, another question. Um, what, what about tradespeople? Does DHR also have a list of people who specialize in traditional trades? That's another blank question, or Julie. 
So that trades directory is everything in one place. Um, and if we were feeling like we really wanted to make it snazzy, we could probably break it out into different um, areas. But there are groups that do many of these things under one roof. So it's not as if it would be unheard of to have historic preservation consultants working on um, planning documents in the same office as architects and, and contractors and things like that. Um, but short answer, it's all within that one trades directory. And you'll really want to look at the side columns, which are labeled by the uh, self-reported things that each group listed there does. And the uh, list is in the chat, just to um, repeat that, if anybody's looking for the link to that. Um, and we also have uh, another question uh, in the um, Q&A. Um, I think this is uh, for me, does uh, GNH keep track of materials and installations which are more and less effective? Um, absolutely, I think um, it's essential that, um, that people are, um, whoever your consultant is, whatever they're doing, uh, supplies to more than, than just um, than what we're doing, but um, you need to learn from what you're doing and, and um, constantly um, monitor and, um, and follow up and make sure that things are being done um, in the way in which they were anticipated to function um, and learn if, if they weren't. So um, I would say, yes, that should be something that um, any consultant does on, on any area that they're supposed to be an expert in. Do we have any other questions? I'm scanning. I think I have um, seen all the questions in the chat or the Q&A. Um, I think we can wrap up then. I will hand it back to Elizabeth. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, Blake and Dave and Julie and Sonia. It's been a fascinating evening. I We've all learned something. I think we'll also be consulting that directory quite often um, and probably coming back to you all individually sometime in the future just to ask specific questions. But we appreciate everybody's participation tonight, everybody that tuned in. Um, look for next year's curriculum. Um, we are always open. If there are burning questions that you think we could answer in a webinar, uh, we'd love to, to know those so that we can start to plan out that um, 2023 series of educational programs. So thank you once again, and we look forward to seeing you as uh, the world opens up. So take care. Bye. Good night. Okay.